In this video, we want to get a sense for what it's like to use Python as a programming language. Obviously, we're not going to cover everything there is to know about Python in a single video, but what I notice is a lot of Cisco professionals have heard about SDN, Software Defined Networking. They know that they need to move their career in that direction. They've heard that they should learn Python programming to do some of this network programmability, but there's a lot of FUD, a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt surrounding Python programming. So the intent of this video is to get rid of the FUD, get rid of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and get you in working with the Python programming environment, actually writing a couple of programs. And I'll encourage you to pause the video as we go through this and do some of the exercises along with me. In order to do that, you'll need to have Python installed. So that's the first thing we want to talk about. You can go to python.org and you can download a version of Python for your particular operating system. Now, I happen to be running on Mac OS and Mac OS comes with Python installed. Linux comes with Python installed. However, if you're running Microsoft Windows, you'll need to do that installation. However, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to install Python on Mac OS anyway. You see, the version that comes with Mac OS, I'm running a Mac OS Sierra. It comes with Python version 2.7. But in the Cisco network programmability world, I noticed that there's a lot of Python 3 code. And I want to be running some version of Python 3. There are some significant differences between Python 2 and Python 3. So I can go to Downloads, and it knows I'm running a Mac OS. It says, hey, do you want to download the current version for Mac OS, Python 3.6.0? This might be different when you're watching the video, but currently the version is Python 3.6.0. And I've already got it installed, but if I didn't, I could click this. I could download the installation package, run the installation, and you can see some of the other versions of Python available. It's available for Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, other platforms, includes MS-DOS. That one kind of blew me away when I saw that one. But I want you to go ahead, pause the video right now, get Python installed on your system, and then we'll start going through some exercises together. All right, do you have Python installed on your system? If so, let's get into it. Now, I'm just sitting at my command prompt on Mac OS. So you should get to whatever the command prompt is in your operating system. And I can get into a Python programming environment just by saying Python. But when I do that, and you notice I'm in that programming environment, this is called the interactive interpreter, because when I issue a command, it's immediately interpreted, and I get the output on the screen. I know I'm in that interactive interpreter environment because I've got these three greater than signs. However, things are not perfect just yet. Notice I'm running Python version 2.7. That's the version that came with my operating system. I've already installed version 3.6. Why did it pull up version 2.7? Well, you can have different versions of Python concurrently installed on your operating system. So how do I say, no, 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 I don't want to run Python 2.7. I want to run Python 3.6. Well, let me exit out of this. By the way, the way we exit out, I can say exit, and I give an open and close parentheses. That's one way of getting me out of that environment. But if I want to run a Python version 3.6, I need to be specific about the version. I say Python, no space, 3.6. Now I'm running Python 3.6.0. Excellent. That's where I want to be. And we're at this interactive interpreter prompt. And we can use Python for lots of things. Obviously, I'm trying to help you get more comfortable with it for your future doing at network programmability, but Python is used for lots of things today. You can, you can program games with Python. I've seen some of those. Python has a lot of mathematical and scientific applications. You can do some really cool uh, graphs and plots using Python. Python is used for web development. Of course, our main focus, our main goal is to eventually use it for network programmability, but what we're going to cover in this video would be applicable to all those different Python applications. And I said that we're sitting at the interactive interpreter, meaning when I give a command, it's immediately interpreted and we get the results on screen. For example, I could give a math problem to Python. I could say five, and then to say multiplied by, I would give the asterisk, the star. I could say five, star, five, press enter, and it tells me the result is 25. Oh, by the way, white space does not matter. Notice I did five star five. I could have done five space star space five and pressed enter. Same result. White space does not matter. I could also assign a value to a variable. Let's use a variable of x. I'm going to say that x equals four. And let's press enter. And I could do a math problem with that variable now. I could say x times three. That should be 12. Four times three. 
And yes, indeed it is. And we said that the asterisk, the star, that's what we use for multiplication. Well, if I wanted to do division, I could say 12 forward slash 4. It gets me divided by plus would be simply 12 plus 4, 12 minus 4. Raising something to an exponent, though, let's say 4 squared, which should be 16. I'll say 4, and we give 2 stars. 4 star star, 2, 4 raised to the second power, in other words. That's going to be 16. That's how we can do some basic mathematical operations. And what I've been entering here are integers. An integer does not have a decimal place. I've just been entering whole numbers, in other words. And that's one type of data that Python recognizes. And we're going to talk about several different data types in this video. And if I want to know what type of data I'm dealing with, what is the data type of, of the number 4, I could simply use a function called type. I can say type, T-Y-P-E, and in parentheses I'll say 4 and press enter. And it says that the class, in other words, the type of data is the integer data type, a whole number. What if I gave something that was not an integer? If I said type, and in parentheses 4.5, Suddenly, it's not an integer, it's a floating point value. That's what float means. I could have strings as well, like a name, some sort of alphanumeric string. I could say, what is the type of, in parentheses, and to say that this is a string, I'm going to put it in quotes. I'll say, in quotes, Kevin, close quotes. Put that in parentheses, and it says, str. This is the data type of a string. I can even do mathematical operations with strings, which is kind of interesting. If I just say Kevin in quotes and press enter, it comes back with Kevin. Now, notice it came back with single quotes. I entered double quotes. Those are interpreted the same. In fact, I could use single quotes. I could say single quote, Kevin, single quote, enter, and it just says Kevin. But check this out. I could say in quotes, Kevin times four, and it's going to print Kevin four times on screen. So at this point, we've seen three data types. The integer, which is a whole number, a floating point data type, which is a number with a decimal, and we've seen a string data type, which can be an alphanumeric string enclosed in quotes. And if I want to print something to the screen, I can use a function called print. We've already seen one function called type. We said type, and we put something in parentheses. Well, I can similarly say print and put something in parentheses. You see, these are functions. A function takes some sort of an input and creates some sort of an output. I'm going to say print, and then in parentheses, I'll say, quote, and my name, Kevin space Wallace, close quote, close parentheses, and it prints that on screen. And remember how I assigned uh, the number 4 to the variable of x? I can assign a string to variables as well. I'm going to say that my variable of first name equals, in quotes, Kevin, and when I print this out, I'm going to print my first name, I'll print a space, and then I'll print my last name. So I'm going to say, as another variable, I'll say space equals, and in quotes, I'll just enter a space. And I'll say last name equals Wallace. And by the way, just a quick word about the way I'm naming these variables. This is a commonly used approach in uh, programming. This is using something called a mixed case. This is where I put words together and I capitalize the first letter in every word except the first word. So first, the first word here, the F is lowercase, but any other word I put in the string, like name, I'm going to begin that with a capital. So last name, the L is lowercase. Any subsequent words, they're going to start with an uppercase letter. Now, let's use these variables to print out my name. I'll say print, and of course you can use your name for this, and I'll print the variable of first name, and then I will concatenate these together. I'm going to stick them together by saying first name plus space plus last name, close parentheses, and it prints my name. Now let's take a look at another data type, a Boolean data type. A Boolean data type can say if something is true or false. For example, I could say type and put in the word true, press enter, and it says B-O-O-L, that's short for Boolean. And the true has an uppercase T, the rest is lowercase. Same thing for false, it's a uppercase F and the rest of the letters are lowercase in the word false. It's not going to be recognized as a Boolean data type if it's anything else. It cannot be all lowercase, it cannot be all caps. The first letter has to be capitalized. So that's the Boolean data type. And we can do some Boolean tests. We can see if one value equals another value. 
If one value does not equal a value, if a value is greater than, if a value is greater than or equal to, these are Boolean tests that we can perform. For example, I could do a test and say, does the first name equal Kevin? I'll say first name, and we've already assigned it to Kevin, so we know it does. The way I do a Boolean test is not to enter just a single equal sign. A single equal sign would set a value. If I said first name equals Kevin in quotes, it would set the first name variable to equal Kevin. But if I'm doing a test, if I'm doing an evaluation, I'm going to give two equal signs. So first name equals equals, and then in quotes, Kevin. Does the first name equal Kevin? And it comes back and says true. Yes, it does. What if I say, does the first name equal Wallace? And we know it does not. It's going to come back and say false. Here's how you do a not equal to. I could say, does the first name not equal to Wallace? I can do an exclamation point equals or a bang equals. And this should actually come back true because the first name is Kevin. And it says, does the first name not equal Wallace? Well, that's true. The first name does not equal Wallace. It's Kevin. So it comes back and it says it is true. We could also do tests for numbers. I could say, is 5 less than or equal to 4? No, it's not. False. Is 3 less than 3? No, it's not less than 3. It's equal to 3. So I could say, is 3 less than or equal to 3? Yes, that comes back as true. I could also search a string. I could say, is the letter W in? I give the keyword of in. Is the uh, letter W in the string of last name? It is. It begins with a W. And it says, yes, that is true. And oftentimes when we're working with Boolean operations, we want to check a condition. Does something equal something else? Is something less than this? Is something greater than this? And based on the result, based on if something is true or false, we want to do something. If it's true, we want to do this. If it's false, we want to do something else. So we can do some conditional operations. And we're going to use the if statement to do that. Let's start off with a really basic one. I'm going to say if... 10 is less than 100. And I'm going to put a colon here. When I put a colon here and press enter, notice that my prompt changes. It allows me to create a compound instruction, multiple lines of instructions. Notice my prompt went from the greater than signs to three dots. I'm saying if 10 is less than 100, and it is, then I want to do something. And to say I want to do this, if and only if, 10 is less than 100, I need to give an indention. I typically use four spaces. You can use three, you can use five. I typically say one, two, three, four spaces. If 10 is indeed less than 100, I'll say print. In parentheses, I'll say quote, 10 is less than 100, which is pretty obvious. Close quote, close parentheses. We'll press enter. And to execute this, I just press enter one more time. And because that was a true statement, it says 10 is less than 100. But what if the Boolean test had been false instead of true? Well, nothing would have happened in this case. But sometimes, like we were saying, we want to do this action if it's true, and we want to do some other action if it's false. Let's do another example. I'm going to assign a couple of variables. In the uh, collaboration world, oftentimes we want the data VLAN to be the same as the native VLAN on a switch, and then the voice VLAN can be a different VLAN. So let's say we want to test to see if our native VLAN equals our data VLAN. I'll just statically code these right now. I'll say native VLAN, and I'm making VLAN all uppercase because it's an acronym, native VLAN equals one. And I'll say that my data VLAN equals something else, 100. Now let's give our if statement. I'll say if the native VLAN, double equal sign, if it equals the data VLAN, colon, now I need to give that indention. I'll say one, two, three, four spaces. If the native VLAN does indeed equal the data VLAN, I'll say then I want to print, in quotes which are in parentheses, I'll say print the native and data VLANs are the same. Close parentheses. However, what if they're not? What do I do instead? Well, I'm going to say else. Now notice that I don't indent this. This indented line of print only gets executed if this statement is true. However, if this statement is not true, we're going to jump down to the next line that's not indented, which in this case is else. We're saying do something else if this is not true. So I'll do an else colon, 
press enter, another indention of one, two, three, four spaces, and I'll say print, and in quotes in parentheses, I'll say the native and data VLANs are different. Close quote, close parentheses, and let's press enter to see what happens. And it says, ah, oh, the native and data VLANs are different, and they are. We just used the print function based on the output of a Boolean operation. We could even do some compound Boolean decisions. We could use AND and OR to say, if this equals this AND, this equals this AND, this equals this. We could say, if this equals this OR, this equals something else, then we're going to carry out an action. For example, staying in the collaboration world, oftentimes voice packets, they have a quality of service marking at layer 2 of a 5, a COS, a class of service value of a 5. At layer 3, they might have a marking of a DSCP, differentiated services code point. They might have a DSCP value of 46. Those are best practice recommendation markings. And let's say that my COS value does indeed equal 5, and my DSCP value does indeed equal 46. I can do a compound Boolean evaluation to see if the layer 2 and layer 3 markings are correct. And if they are, I'm going to say, hey, I think we're looking at voice traffic here. I'll say if COS double equal sign 5 and, this makes it a compound Boolean expression, if COS equal 5 and DSCP double equal sign 46, we'll give our colon, press enter, indent. If those values are 5 and 46, I'm going to say print, and then in quotes and parentheses, this is a voice packet. Close quote, close parentheses. What if those are not the right values? We'll say else. If they're not, 1, 2, 3, 4 is my intention. I'll say print in quotes and parentheses. This is not a voice packet. Close quote, close parentheses. Now let's press enter. Well, because my COS and DSCP values are what I was looking for, we met both conditions. That's what the AND means. Then it printed out, this is a voice packet. If I had used an OR here, then either one of these values would have qualified for a true result. My COS could have been 5 and my DSCP could have been 10. And it still would have worked if I would said OR here. But because I said AND, both conditions have to be true. OR means either condition has to be true. Well, I don't know about you, but I think it's time for a brand new data type. Let's talk about the list data type. You see, at this point, we've assigned a single value to a single variable. We said x equals 4, first name equals Kevin. What if I want to store several things in a variable? I could have a list. For example, I could say inventory equals, and the way I put things in a list variable is I put them inside open and close brackets. So let's say that my inventory, we'll do an open bracket, and I'll put these in quotes because they're strings. I'll say, in my inventory, I've got a catalyst 3750, close quote, and these are comma separated values. So I'll say comma, and then in quotes, let's say I've also got a catalyst 2960, close quote, comma. Maybe I've got a 2911 router close quote, comma, and maybe I've got a 7965G IP phone, close quote, and we'll close our brackets. I've now created this list variable, which I've called inventory. And I can see that it's a list data type by saying type, like we did earlier, and in parentheses I'll say inventory, close parentheses, and it says, yeah, this time the data type is list. And by the way, another function that's handy from time to time is the length function. I can say len, and it's going to tell me the length of, of a string as an example. I could say len, and in parentheses, in quotes, I'll say Kevin, close quote, close parentheses. And it's going to come back and say five, because there are five characters in the name Kevin. But I can also use that length function on my list. I could say how many items are in my list. I could say len, and in parentheses, I say inventory, the name of my list, close parentheses, Four. I've got four items in my inventory. If I want to see all of those items, I can simply say inventory, and there they are. I could search my inventory because I might have 10,000 items here. It might fill up several screens. I can say, I'm just curious, do I have a Catalyst 3750 in this list called inventory? Yes, I do. It comes back as true. I do have an item named Catalyst 3750. 
What if I want to extract specific values from that list? Well, the numbering starts at zero. So if I want to take a look at the very first value in my list, I could say inventory, and then in brackets, I put a zero because it begins with a zero. Close bracket. And it says the first item is a Catalyst 3750. Similarly, I could say inventory one. This is going to give me my second value in the list, which is a Catalyst 2960. What if I wanted to jump to the end and see the very last value? Well, here we start counting with negative numbers. I could say inventory negative one, and that's going to give me the very last item in my list, which is going to be that IP phone. If I want to see the second to last item, you guessed it, it's a negative two, which is my 2911 router. I could also add to this list, I could say inventory, which is the name of my list, and then I can use the append function. I can say inventory dot append, and in parentheses and in quotes, I want to add a new item to my inventory. I'll say CUCME server. I guess CUCME is actually a router, but I'll say CUCME server. I enter that, and suddenly that's added to the end of my list. We can confirm that by saying inventory, and there it is right at the end of the list. And if I use the LEN function again, now we have five items instead of four items. So now we've seen an integer data type, a floating point data type, a string data type, a Boolean data type, and a list data type. Now let's take a look at how we can do looping. Looping is very powerful within a programming language. Let me give you an example. I want to say four, and I'm going to come up with a variable name myself. It's going to be, let's say, item. This is going to represent a single item in the inventory. I'll say for item in inventory, colon, let's press enter. And what this is going to do, it's going to look at the very first entry in that inventory and assign it to the variable of item. And then it's going to execute any indented instructions. And then it's going to come back and look at the second entry in that list and execute all the indented instructions again. Here's the instruction I want to give now. I'm going to say one, two, three, four spaces to indent. And I'll say print whatever the value of item is now in parentheses. Do you see what's happening here? I'm going to press enter and it's going to take a look at the very first item in this inventory. And for as long as there are items to look at, we're going to be looping through this. So the first item is going to be 3750. And it's going to come back and print that item because at this point, as it goes through this list the first time, the variable of item equals catalyst to 3750. Once it does that, it goes back and starts again. It says four. In other words, it checks to see, are there other items in this list? Yes, there are. Let's move on to the next one. It's going to say four item in inventory. And this time, item is going to be the next value. It's going to be the catalyst 2960. And it's going to print catalyst 2960. Let's prove it. Let's press enter. And it executed that print item command five times. It went through this loop five times. And then we were out of items. So the four statement said, uh, we're out. So I'm not going to execute anything now. I'm not going to do anything else. We're going to stop. And we could get a little creative now and combine our loops with our if statement. Maybe I just want to look for any catalyst switches in my inventory. I could do something like this. I could say for item in inventory colon just like I did before and I'll give my indention one two three four spaces but now I'm going to give an if statement I'm going to say if the string of catalyst is in the variable item colon you see the first time when we go through the variable item is going to be assigned a value of catalyst 3750 the next time we go through this loop the variable of item is going to be assigned to catalyst 2960 the next time, item is going to equal 2911 router. So you see only twice will item actually contain the word catalyst. And maybe I just want to print out the catalysts from my inventory. So I give another colon. And when I do that, that's saying that I'm going to indent again. I need to do two indentions now. One, two, three, four for the first indention. And one, two, three, four for the second indention. And I'm going to give a print statement. This print statement will only execute if the word catalyst is currently in the variable item. I'll say print. And in parentheses, I'll print the variable item. Remember, the variable item is going to take on five different values as it goes through this list. Only twice will this if statement return a true result. Only twice will the word catalyst be in the item. I'll press enter and press enter again. 
And notice we looped through our inventory list five times, one time for each item, but only twice did the if statement produce a true result. Only twice did we have the word catalyst in what was currently the item. And when we did, we printed those values. So this tells me I've got two catalysts in my inventory. And obviously Python has lots and lots of other functions that we could get into, but I thought this would be a good way to, to start working with Python at the command prompt. In other words, at the interactive interpreter. But when we're writing programs, maybe we're writing a program to go out and speak to a Cisco APIC controller to go change some values on our Cisco Catalyst switches, our Cisco routers, and so on. Instead of entering all these commands at the command line, I probably want to run a program. How do I do that? Well, let's take a look at how we can create a Python program using some of the commands we've already learned, and I'll even introduce a new command as part of one of those programs. But let's get out of this environment. By the way, I love this environment. I love the fact that we can enter a command and have it immediately interpreted. I remember when I was learning uh, C programming a long time ago, I would have to compile a program and then execute it. So I love the fact that we've got this command line interpreter, but for the real world, yeah, we're gonna to need to actually write programs that get executed. How do we do that? Well, let me get out of this interactive interpreter. I'm gonna say exit, open, and close parentheses, and I'm going to type in the command idle, I-D-L-E, and I want to be running specifically idle version 3.6, so I'll say that, idle 3.6. Idle is an acronym that stands for Integrated Development Environment, and this is typically in the real world where I will be executing these commands. And once I enter idle 3.6, I've already got it up in a different window, but once you enter that, it's going to pull up a window much like this. I can press enter. It looks like we're at that interactive command prompt, and we are. I like this a little bit better, though, than doing it at the operating system command line because it's sort of color-coded. For example, I can say print, and in parentheses, quote, Kevin. Notice it gives me some color coding to show me everything in green is my string. It shows me when I've completed my parentheses. It helps eliminate errors as I'm typing in some of the more complex commands. So the things we were doing at the interactive interpreter, we could do here. However, if we want to write a program, we can go under File and say New File. I've already created a new file. It's here in the, in the left window. And here we could start entering our commands. Now, by the way, when we were at the interactive interpreter, we could get by with things like saying 5 times 5 and pressing Enter. We're not able to do that. Within a program, we have to be a bit more formal than that. We would have to say that x equals 5 times 5, and then we want to print the value of x. So we need to actually say print if we want something to show up on the screen. So keeping that in mind, let's write, well, I guess we should start with the traditional first program that uh, students typically write when they're learning a new programming language, and that's, of course, the Hello World program. We know that we can say print, and in parentheses and in quotes, I'll say, Hello World close quote, close parentheses. Let's save this. I'll say save as, and I'll save this as HW1 for Hello World 1. And let's run it. I'll say run, run module, and we'll see the results here in the idle window. And it says Hello World. And if you've learned other programming languages, odds are pretty good that you started with a Hello World program. And now that we've got this very simple program out of the way, let's do something a bit more complex, a bit more useful. Let me just delete that and let's start over. Let's say that I want to create a program that will allow me to add an item to my inventory, sort of building on the example we had earlier. I'm going to begin by declaring what my inventory is. I'll say inventory. Now, of course, Python can work with external files on your operating system. We're not going to get into that in this video, so I'm just going to define this locally within the program. I'm going to say inventory equals, and then in brackets, I'm going to say, in quotes, catalyst, 3750, close quote, comma, and then we've got a catalyst, 2960, close quote, comma, and in quotes, I've got a 2911 router, close quote, comma. And finally, in quotes, let's say that I've got a 7965G IP phone, close quote, close bracket. I've now defined this list variable of inventory. And as part of this program, I can say print that list variable. It's going to list out everything in the inventory. Now, Here's where I can prompt a user to enter some input. This is a new command we haven't talked about yet. I can say, 
I want the user to add a new inventory item, and then I want to append whatever they tell me, I want to append that to this list. And then I'll print out the inventory again. Here's how I do that. Here's how I ask the user for information and take what they tell me and put that in a variable. I'm gonna create a variable name of item. I just made that up. I'll say item equals, and here's the new function that we haven't talked about yet. It's input, item equals input, and then in parentheses in quotes, I'm gonna say, enter new inventory item, close quote, close parentheses. We'll press enter. This will print on the screen, enter new inventory item. The user enters that item, and when they do, we're gonna take the value that they give us, which now belongs to the variable called item, and we're going to append that to the current inventory, just like we did earlier at the interactive command prompt. I'll say inventory dot append, remember doing this earlier, and in parentheses, whatever the value of item is, which is whatever the user told me, we're going to append that to the inventory. And once we've done that, we're gonna print out the inventory again. In fact, let's go up and make this a, a bit prettier when it prints out. Let's say print, and I'll just give a string, the current inventory is, and then after we've added this to the inventory, let's do it again. In fact, let me just copy and paste this. Copy, paste. So again, we're gonna say the inventory is, and it's gonna give us the new inventory now that we've appended this item. Before I can run a program, I've gotta save it. I'm gonna save it, and let's go run it again. And we'll see the output over here. And it says the current inventory is, and it's these four items. It says enter new inventory item, so it's asking me for some input. I'll say the new inventory item is that 7965G IP phone. And then it says, okay, now the current inventory is these five items. Notice it's appended what I entered. That's how we can write a Python program. That's how we can get some input from the user. So we've taken a look at the very basics of Python in this video. Again, the intent was not to teach you everything you'll ever need to know about Python, but it was to remove the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that so many Cisco networking engineers seem to have as they start to approach the world of SDN. And in this video, you've learned some really useful things that will pay off big time when you're doing network programming. Just a quick review, we learned several different data types. We learned about the integer, we learned about floating point, the string, the Boolean data type, we learned about the list data type. We saw how we could extract values from a list, the first value, the second value, the last value, and display those on screen. We saw how we could append to the list. We saw how we could do looping. We saw how we could do a Boolean test using if and the else statement. And we could even do that inside of a loop. And we saw that we could do all of those things if we wanted to from the interactive command prompt. But if we want to write a program, we saw how we could go into this idle environment and start a new file enter our Python commands, save the file, run the file, and we get to see the results on screen. So that's our introductory look at Python.